this this came to me my, my jackie mentioned that she'd been reading about this as well because there was um there's been a book by julie mcdowell called attack warning red how britain prepared for nuclear war um which is very interesting about that whole area and it, it made me think about britain and the threat of nuclear conflict generally because i don't know about you but for when i was younger it was much more important than it is now i i really did think about it anyway the, the bit the things i'm going to look at the threat of nuclear war the, the 1953 strath committee the uh, Peter Watkins film, The War Game, from 1966, um, uh, and Threads, which was on in 1984, which I didn't see at the time. Nuclear tests, the regional seats of government, the growth in ar nuclear arsenals, local campaigns, including the Green Greenham Common Women and Chalton Against the Missiles, um, protest and survive, and then comparing it with climate change. So... <laughs> here we go if you can't see anything let me know or hear anything let me know so this is what i'm looking at so the um we've if you think about it the hiroshima explosion which we're all very familiar with and again had a big impact as an, on i imagine when we were young seeing images of that with thousands dead and a city devastated of course they that was an a-bomb and in just a few years later, in 1952, there was the first H-bomb, and then the Russians had exploded their own in 1953. And if you think about it, we've been living that with that now for 70 years. Mm. And we still have not had such wood, such anything you've got, um, any, any form of, of nuclear warfare. Though... I think we can be a bit too compl complacent about that. And with the regional events in the Ukraine and Russia, uh, I think it's far more possible than it has been in previous years. The Strath Committee. Th this is something I, I never knew about. And it's not unusual, really, because whilst the report was actually given to the government in 1955, it was only declassified in 2002. It was a secret committee led by Sir William Strath, which estimated the type of damage and casualties that Great Britain would suffer from a limited Soviet thermonuclear attack of 10 hydrogen bombs dropped on UK cities. And according to the report, it would be utter devastation with over 12 million deaths and 4 million serious injuries. Also, there was the capability then of moving to missile delivery rather than by bombers, which was the original way that they had of delivering them, which, of course, reduced the time of any warning that would happen. The photograph behind it, by the way, is of the Grapple X detonation in November 1957. So, Sir William Strath. He was educated in uh, the University of Glasgow. He, be, he joined the Air Ministry in 1938 and the Ministry of Aircraft Production in 1940. And he sat on the UK Atomic Energy Authority from 1955 to 59, crucial times. Then he became a permanent secretary of the Ministry of Supply and the Ministry of Aviation until 1961, where he moved almost immediately to become managing director of Tube Investments, and he he, he served there until 1973. And at that time, the the only things that the um, that the government took on board of all the ideas that he had in terms of evacuating 15 million people, which became irrelevant once the time of actually notification of arrival of the bomb got down to about three minutes, I think, in the end. You can't do much in that time. You um, can't. But they, they developed emergency plans. The only one that there was kept, though, were the development of regional seats of government. Do you remember, though, the RSGs, regional seats of government, and in which... Local, uh, regional local authorities will be able to dispense justice through special military war zone courts. There was a top secret underground bunker built in the Cotswolds to shelter the cabinet and selected military civil service and intelligence figures. The, uh, as I said, there were plans to, to evacuate more than 15 million, but they couldn't count on that after a short time. It was OK when there were bombers, but when it was missiles, it became impossible. And apparently there was also one of the ideas was to have one up in the Shetlands, I think it was, 
uh, where the Queen would be evacuated to a McBain ferry. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it was the, um, not the Shetlands, but the, the Orkneys, and um, which were actually developed with, to be nuclear proofed to a certain extent in the, in the way that they were built, which I didn't know. And the Queen and her family was to be taken up there. Do any, did you ever remember, do any of you seen the war game in 19, 1966? It's the Peter Watkins film, which I think is incredible if you see the whole of it. If you've seen the whole of it, it certainly had a big impact of me. And in my first teaching job, I, I taught general studies and I showed it to almost all the classes because it had been banned on TV. It wasn't shown on TV until 1985. And this is just to give you a flavour of it and a couple of minutes from it. This could be the way the last two minutes of peace in Britain would look. Nine sixteen AM, a single megaton nuclear missile overshoots Manston Airfield in Kent and air bursts six miles from this position. this distance, the heat wave is sufficient to cause melting of the upturned eyeball, third degree burning of the skin, and ignition of furniture. <laughs> Twelve seconds later, the shock front arrives. <laughs> Quite powerful stuff, wasn't it? Very. It's still it's still powerful to this day. He, I think, he was an amazing. Um, it, it actually got a premiership at the National Film Theatre in 1966, and a very limited release in cinemas. And in 67, it won the Academy Award Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. And 18 years later, it was actually shown on TV. There, were, there was also in 1984 something which. I don't I never saw at the time, which was also supposedly very, very frightening, called Threads. Did anybody see that? Anybody watch that? No, it's, it didn't seem to have caused that much impact. No. no. But it, of course, all of these were deliberately kept from people because it didn't want to induce panic, uh, no. which is I mean, it's, it's understandable, isn't it? But just no. a couple, couple of shots. This is the um a 23 kiloton tower shot called Badger fired on April the 18th, 1953 at the Nevada test site. And this was the 1st of March, 1954. Mushroom cloud from the, the Castle Bravo thermonuclear weapon, largest nuclear weapons test ever conducted by the United States. That's when, that was a, a day before my seventh birthday. <laughs> I mean, we we basically, we we are the children of this era. We've not known anything different. Though at the time, and in the 1980s, I was very much active in all this. And this, of course, is the regional seats of government. They were built um, 115 feet underground, still guarded by security staff. Uh, it was in 1954, remained a secret for over a decade, and their, own, their existence was only acknowledged in 1968. Um, anyway, this one's in uh, in in Nantwich, which is still there. And this was and they they also had subregions. And this was the Manchester War Room in the grounds of Alexandra Hospital in Mill Lane, Cheadle, opened in 1952, remained in operation to 1958, when they were replaced by the regional seats of government, and it was de demolished by 2009. Again, that's probably the closest, except for the. Um, Guardian Telephone Exchange, which was used as one in 1954. Now, in the 1980s, I'd been doing, I, we'd done some research with BT. They invited us to a, a, a grand tour of these, these, this bunker, which you enter in a building just off Manchester's Oxford Street. You know where the Gaumont Cinema was? Behind there, there is a building, totally anonymous looking building. You go into it, its walls have got barbed wire on it, you go into it, and then it opens up to a huge big, like a, a bank vault uh, door, where you go into a lift, 
it takes you um, but quite deep below the water course has to be kept continually pumped and there they are, you went you 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 went into an area where there were sleeping areas working areas in order to give us some of the flavor they they put on sort of wartime music for us as we went through and we walked along that tunnel which was done in the red white and blue lighting of that BT used at the time to the other end and came up in Piccadilly the government acted on almost none of these strata recommendations, except for because by then in the 1980s, there uh, there were 64,000 nuclear warheads world, worldwide. They've been reduced since then. In a poll in the 1980s, 70 percent of young people in Britain saw nuclear war as inevitable. It, it had a very big impact. I think what also had an impact was the. Um, the effect of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Do you remember that one? I think I must have been around age 15. I can certainly remember at school thinking about that, thinking about whether it had happened. There were a few days when it looked as if there could be a real possibility of nuclear warfare because the Russians were installing uh, nuclear weapons on Cuba. Though previously, of course, America had, st had started putting them in Turkey as well, pointed at Russia. But let's let's not go into the complexities of it. But it certainly had a big impact on me, thinking that, that we were that close to it. There have been other close shaves as well since then. So that led to a, lo a lot of local campaigns. There are posters from Leicester, Leeds, Bristol, Kirklees and Hull. The Hull one and the bomb was particularly graphic when they superimposed a mushroom cloud on the top of Hull <laughs> which, <laughs> and sold it for 50p as part of a leaflet, I imagine. And in 1980, later on, um, Manchester declared itself to be a nuclear-free zone. Do you remember those posters around the town? They also yeah. had a nuclear freeze, um, a nuclear peace in the Peace Garden near the town hall. And this was a um, sculpture, Messenger of Peace, which was then they got rid of all this because the Peace Garden had to go because they were doing more development there. And it's now been re relocated to Lincoln Square. Brasenose Street, it's right, right, opposite, right opposite the town hall. Oh, right. I, I, I would completely say. paved the street down with the statue of Abraham Lincoln and then the yeah, squares. There, in. there it is on the left. You can see that. And that's a proposed redevelopment. And I um, I love this photo. This is the um, photo of two punks kissing each other to demonstration of, of Manchester against the missiles in 1981. I was very much in, involved in Chalton against the missiles. And uh, we we even had a a meeting in the old Asoldo Cinema in Chalton, where we 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 uh, we had about two hundred people turned up for it and talked about it, and we we had various demonstrations. I can remember arguing the case for it in Chalton precinct, and being heckled by two old Polish guys, of course. <laughs> had lived under the Russian yoke and weren't going to, from their point of view, they were quite happy to send any missiles we could across there as soon as possible. My first experiences of being heckled. But I just love, love that photo of two punks kissing. It was uh, done by the uh, Roger Hutchings from the Guardian newspaper. That's the that's the symbol we we're talking about, Val. And they they were on all entrances to the to the city. There was one certainly one in Chalm. I don't know whether it's still there. Have you have you noticed whether it's gone or not? I think it's just quietly been taken down sometime. But it was there until quite recently. So the the government the council called on the government to refrain from the manufacture or positioning of any nuclear weapons of any any kind within the boundaries of the city. So we haven't had any nuclear weapons based here. Well, considering they're all based up in. Um, in Scotland, in the submarine areas, it's uh, not surprising. We were all give, sent a booklet called Protect and Survive at the time, which told you what to do to keep you, yourself. In 1963, the, the poster then said to give shelter to anyone caught without protection near your home. In Protect and Survive, Protect and Survive they were told, if there's time, help neighbours in need, meaning don't do anything. No one was to flee. <laughs> <laughs> since um, the other th the authorities in other parts of the country will not help you with food, accommodation or other essentials. As E.P. Thompson wrote in his anti-nuclear 
counterblast protest and survive, which I've still got a copy of, as you can see from the left. Many thousands of nuclear families will be baked, crushed or suffocated to death in their tiny refuges that they constructed. What I didn't know at the time, there was, there was a, 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 the main protagonists of Protect and Survive were in fact companies um, and they even had their own journal called um, Protect and Survive Monthly. It was mainly it consisted of adverts for Geiger counters and shelters with names like the mole and the egg. It had 12,000 subscribers in 1981, but by 1986 it had folded. So the, com the campaign for nuclear disarmament in the, its time, it found in a poll conducted by Maury, would you agree or disapprove of the UK using nuclear weapons against a country we are at war with? Nine, only 9% 9 approved if the country did not have nuclear weapons and 84 disapproved. And those are the symbols. I always remember the only visit I made to um, Germany around about that time was the, th the thousands of posters and leaflet and things stood up on the wall. I saw about nuclear power at Nine Danker around then, much more than in this country. And of course, they they voted eventually to um, get rid of all their atomic power stations. So I see there are calls for them to start them up again because of the power conflict in the world. Anyway, it was founded in 1957 and it organized the Easter Aldermaston March where they, they went from um, the autom atomic weapons establishment near Aldermaston to Trafalgar Square. Uh, but its membership declined from a peak of 110,000 in 1985 to around about 35,000 members now. Something local. This was the Chalton Greenham uh, Greenham women heading off to Greenham Common in the um, 1980s, something like 1984, I think. And uh, I, I knew some of those. That's the Mandarin holding the recording device. And a, a lot of women were involved in this. And I think it was very empowering to women as well that they did get involved in it, flagged off by the usual the, the, in the Daily Mail and the Sun. Uh, but it went on for quite quite a long time. Interestingly, this was from a magazine called Green Chalton that didn't last for very long, community magazine. This, the Conservative councillor called it this horrible abortion. The Conservative councillor Len Sanders hit out last week at the way the controlling group of Labour councillors on Manchester City Council had supported the proposed peace camp in Beach Road Park. The reporter said, I thought it was quite good, as footballers played on undisturbed, <laughs> some women and children from the group lit candles, played music, and erected a polythene tent, while others collected bags of litter in attempts to clean up the park. We're only here for a few hours, she said. It's a symbolic presence. Oh, this was me at the time, by the way, as portrayed in a friend of mine's drawing of me on my bike, which I thought, I think is quite amusing, and was a bit is a bit like I, how I was then. But I just want to end it with uh, talking about its parallels with climate change. Because I think we're in a similar position there. We're still living in the shadow of the apocalypse by nuclear weapons, but we're also living under the shadow of the, an apocalypse because of climate change. And whilst it is true, some scientists hope that technology can outpace it, governments are struggling to reconcile short and long term interests with our own government at the moment trying to is backtracking on a lot of the promises it has made. Extinction Rebellion has also borrowed some of the contacts, tactics from CND, and the super rich are building their own super bunkers in New Zealand. Some people recycle and buy electric cars. Others apathetic, scared, or in denial. Hopelessness can breed helplessness. And I think there is a general feeling about that. I can remember when a we had an American said, came to say, is it okay if it's Yellow is mellow, and if it's brown, flush it down. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Bernard. It's it's really interesting all this stuff about, as you say, to 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 kind of make people feel kind of safe and so on. If one of those things goes off, there's nothing you can do. Absolutely nothing. And there's so much money being wasted 
through through just to make people feel good. We have the biggest uh, uh, protection from radiation coming at us around our Earth, and we're in the process of destroying it by ignoring because of money and trying to keep things as they always are. How many of us will give up the car? How many of us will say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna restructure our lives to make it work? The human being doesn't want to be told the nasty things that are going on. And uh, you know, P Peter Watkins' film, there was a huge discussion about that at the time when it came out. Uh, and uh, uh, and there was also the other one, the guy that did uh, the snowman, who did that uh, uh, book, the, the 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 drawing book. Oh, yeah. um, absolutely spot on in terms of, you know, you can do all this stuff, but it, we we can't combat radiation going into our bodies. You can't do anything about it. It's not possible. You have, we all have to change. Mm. Yeah, but the, the, the problem is you think, well, I'll do this and I'll do that. And I'll not do this and not do that. And other people just merrily go on. So you have literally yes. no effect. And that, that's, what I, because... that's what I think makes people feel a bit despondent. Um, Nigel and I go go to the nth degree to recycle. I mean, we, we recycle we as do. much as we yeah. possibly can. We and I also pick up the recycling from my mum's house. And I've asked the carers, you know, to make sure that they leave it out for me to collect. But then you think, well, you know, if you're the only ones doing it, well, mm. I know what the people do it, but there's an awful lot of people that just don't care, isn't there? We were brought up under austerity, so it just naturally feeds into our, the way that we are. The way that we yeah. I mean, the reality yeah. as well is what happens to that material when you recycle it. It doesn't well, all get it, yeah, it, it's just, it gets shipped to other countries yeah. and dumped. Yeah. It, go, it goes somewhere. It. Yeah. You are making a difference in a very, yeah. very tiny way um, because of the wildlife. Yeah, the, the, everything, yeah. You know, face masks hanging round animals' necks and they're not able to feed. Turtles in the sea covered in plastic. So even though you're only doing a tiny bit, there will just be a couple of insects that probably didn't die because of what you picked up. Yeah. No, but you, that's true. Remember you know. how di how different it is driving along in a car now. You don't have any insect splatter on the windscreen. They no, just, that yeah. that's noticeable this year. Really noticeable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think what it boils down to is trying to do something when you feel helpless. Like you said, helplessness breeds hopelessness, mm. doesn't it? Mm. And if you just do a small thing. It, it but, probably, but, in the scheme of things, doesn't change a lot, but it makes you feel better because uh, you are yeah. at least trying to do yeah. something against this yeah. huge problem that... Okay, you've, uh, got a, you've got a one-minute warning. Upward and upward, comrades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the mellow yellow household. <laughs> Good. Ours is at night. <laughs> Not in the day, in case visitors come, but at night, ours is mellow yellow. Oh, dear. Yeah. Mm. Nice, cheerful topic for today. Yeah. Yes, it was. <laughs> it's reality. Reality. We shouldn't be uh, uh, bothered by that.